even if Trump were to get elected, um, I don't think that the isolationism of American trade policy in particular um, would be altered. In fact, I think it would be actually increased. The, the prospects of any sort of deal with the United States on trade that would remotely match what we have lost through leaving the single market, I think that is totally fantastic. Um, and indeed, it's likely to be uh, even more lopsided um, than any arrangement that would be entailed for, by us rejoining the EU. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today I'll be talking with the chair of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, about the American dimension of Brexit. John, during the referendum of 2016, the Leave campaign assiduously avoided uh, defining what sort of a future they envisaged corporately for the United Kingdom after Brexit. But one of the currents of opinion within the Brexit, within the pro-Brexit coalition, was the idea that the United Kingdom should be more closely aligned with the U United States of America. Um, how important do you think that current of opinion was, and what sort of alignment did the people who were part of that uh, that lobby group, if you will, that coterie, what sort of alignment did they envisage with the United States of America? Well, I think it was very important, and in fact, this debate between whether Britain is closer to the United States or closer to Europe goes back a very long way and precedes our entry into the EC, indeed. Uh, and it is this attempt to be uh, Janus faced, essentially, to be both close to America and close to Europe, which underpinned our entire approach to our membership. And the desire to tilt that balance and to move more in a Europe, in a European or an American direction, underlies the tensions that led up to Brexit. What sort of uh, alignment was it that that was envisaged? What was it one that uh, envisaged an economic model, a domestic economic model for the United Kingdom, more like that of the United States, uh, and in particular with reduced level of social provision um, by government? Well, the irony is that. The closer Europe became to a United States of Europe as a project, uh, it, trying to recreate essentially in Europe the scale and the economic integration that the continental market of the United States has, the, the more the British became unhappy with the project because of its political dimension. And certain elements, particularly in the Conservative Party, then moved in the direction of wishing to be much more like America in terms of economic policy, with lower taxation, with less social provision, and all the rest. And this, I suppose, uh, crystallized in what has been shorthand described as a Singapore on Thames vision of Britain. But it is somewhat more complicated than that, because involved with an Americanized vision of Britain's future was also ideas of being a much more uh, immigrant-friendly society in some respects, like America, and one which was emphatically global in its outlook, not continental European. But the American influence has been very powerful, both among anti-Europeans and pro-Europeans in Britain, but in different ways. Were uh, these visions, these overlapping visions of uh, Singapore on Thames and uh, the United States as an economic model, were, were they ever saleable to the British public? Uh, it seems to me that uh, um, the reason why uh, the, the pro-US lobby kept rather quiet about um, what they wanted during the referendum was they knew how unattractive this would be to many voters, an enormous majority of voters in the United Kingdom. Well, a measure of the schizophrenia of British thinking about its relationship with Europe and America was that in a sense it wanted an American levels of taxation and European levels of social provision. And of course that doesn't add up. And I think more broadly, the idea that Britain is uh, a society more like America, which of course is um, an immigrant based society um, historically, uh, and less of a rooted society like continental Europe. That has also become part of the debate. 
Um, but the, the essential driver in Brexit, and certainly the financial support for Brexit, came from those who wanted a much closer uh, following of an American economic model, one of deregulation and a much more capitalist, purer capitalist and liberal economic agenda. There are people who say that the United Kingdom has ended up with European levels of, uh, of tax and American levels of, of public service, but, but that's uh, another more controversial. I mean, that does seem increasingly plausible. Um, since 2016, how successful do you think the, the what we might call the Singapore on Thames or the pro-US lobby been um, in, in realising their vision of a United Kingdom more aligned with the U United States? Uh, was the failure to sign uh, a favourable trade agreement, was, was that a setback for, the, for this current of opinion? Well, absolutely critical among those who sought a and, st and still seek a, a much closer relationship with the United States is a, a trade deal. And the problem for them is that the more America um, pursues its current path of increasing isolationism uh, and its current geopolitical path, which is overall reducing the level of globalization in the world economy and encouraging onshoring, um, reversing indeed the, the, the trends of the last 30 years, the more difficult the position of Brexit Britain becomes and the more difficult it is to imagine uh, any sort of trade deal that would even remotely match uh, what we have lost by leaving the, the European single market. And I think beyond that, there is the, the problem of the, the increasing influence of American debates over British politics. I'm thinking particularly in the, the, the cultural wars, the, um, the difficulties of uh, dealing with multiculturalism and the rest, all these issues which have come into the British debate uh, largely through America and the extent to which American politics dominates uh, a lot of British political thinking in the way that it simply doesn't to the same degree on the continent. You talked about America's present path. That's under President Biden. Uh, do you think that would change, become more accentuated under a President Trump? Well, it's certainly true that some conservatives, particularly those who wish to see Nigel Farage being brought into um, conservative politics and perhaps become a conservative leader even, um, do have high hopes that a Trump presidency will somehow deliver this um, uh, free trade deal that, that um, they, they seek and which they need indeed to justify their entire uh, approach. But that would um, only be if uh, the Conservatives were in government, surely? Well, quite. Um, although precisely how a Labour government would deal with the Trump administration is, is, a, is a separate um, problem. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, I think that even if Trump were to get elected, um, I don't think that the isolationism of American trade policy in particular um, would be altered. In fact, I think it would be actually increased. The, the prospects of any sort of deal with the United States on trade that would remotely match what we have lost through leaving the single market, I think that is totally fantastic. Um, and indeed, it's likely to be uh, even more lopsided um, than any arrangement that would be entailed for, by us rejoining the EU because of the enormous power that, that the American economy has relative to the UK economy. And in particular, in, in crucial areas of industry and of agriculture. So uh, the, the, the notion that somehow we can uh, join the, the US single market having left the European single market is, I, I think, Fantastic. And then on top of that, you've even you've got all the political dimension that flows from that, the the lack of um, British influence over uh, US policy uh, in, a, in a whole range of ways. I mean, the whole point of in, in the EU is that we had a say at the table. We, we couldn't call all the shots, but we had very significant influence as one of the largest countries in the European Union. And that the other large countries that we're dealing with were more or less the same sort of size as us and carried the same sort of weight, the collegiality of the European Union uh, in its policy formation. It's a very important feature. That is something which is 
uh, inconceivable in any relationship between the UK and the US. Let's go and, and talk about what we think might be the implications of a Labour government, um, particularly working with the Trump pre presidency. How, how do you think that would um, would shape up? Well, defence is the issue that will really um, come to the fore, obviously, here. And Trump's uh, attitudes towards the war in Ukraine and towards NATO, I think he's going to put Britain in a very difficult position um, because our defence policy is now so closely integrated with that of the United States. And this is true even in the area where, which is most important for European defence, which is in the strategic area. I mean, we've just had further proof of the complete dependence of our nuclear deterrent on American technology uh, and American systems. And uh, the this makes it very difficult to see how, in the short run at any rate, Britain can integrate itself into a truly sovereign European defence, which would rest in part on creating creating a, a nuclear umbrella for Europe that would be independent of the United States. But I think it's also in other areas too, because the more uh, Europe rearms, continental Europe rearms, the less weight the British contribution has within the overall system. And the notion that Britain is going to be able to play a very significant role in European rearmament, I think it, it's an easy thing to say, and on, on on the face of it, it, it looks logical. But the more one examines precisely the way in which the continental Europeans are likely to pursue their rearmament, the more difficult it is to see how Britain would fit into that. In 2016, very few people could have envisaged the uh, Ukraine war, uh, which in many ways has um, upset entirely the geostrategic chessboard um, in continental Europe. Um, do you think that that war has um, exacerbated and uh, made even more painful the choice that the United Kingdom may have to make between um, Europe and the United States of America? Well, I, I think the assumption that Britain will inevitably get involved in uh, the European perception of Ukraine um, and that this would survive any American retreat from Ukraine, I think, is un is unsound. I think it's much more likely, um, even with a Labour government, that um, were America to distance itself from Ukraine or impose some form of peace um, on Ukraine that would probably not last, but some uh, compromise arrangement, um, and nevertheless lead to continued European rearmament. The, um, Britain would be more dragged behind US policy more widely. And this is where you know, our, our engagement or re-engagement in the Indian Ocean, our uh, degree of support for a confrontation with China in the Pacific, the deal with, the, with Australia over uh, submarines and the rest. I mean, it does seem that a more plausible path uh, for Britain could be uh, that we become a satellite of United States policy globally. Now, whether that would be sustainable, either financially or or in terms of uh, political support in Britain, is, is quite a different matter. I mean, whether the British uh, people will really feel that they are more threatened by what happens vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan uh, than they are what happens vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine is, is an open question. But uh, I think the, the notion that uh, the European option is um, one that will be um, accepted by British governments in the short run, even Labour governments, is not certain. Um, but at a popular level, I think this is the, the real question, is do, do the British people feel fundamentally closer to the United States and its policies to or, or to Europe? And uh, that that divide is a very profound one, has many aspects, and it, it lies at the heart of the question of how Britain can eventually rejoin the EU. But the willingness of the United Kingdom's public opinion uh, to identify with American analyses more than European analyses um, 
will surely be upset and compromised by the personality of Trump, who is so unpopular in this country. It will be a, 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 a testing to destruction, um, the willingness of the British political elite to accept the American lead if, if they were prepared to do a, an about face entirely on Ukraine um, at, uh, at Trump's bidding. I think that's true. I think Trump is a very unpopular figure. Um, but I, I think that these arguments go far beyond his personal contribution or lack of it um, to uh, the, the debate. America is heading in a more isolationist direction. Its interests are much more focused on China than they are on anywhere else, uh, certainly than on Europe. Uh, and that is not going to change. It, 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 the, the difference between Trump and Biden is one of pace and tone and moral quality, I think. Um, it's, not, um, it's not a fundamental difference of, of underlying strategy. And for Britain, therefore, the question is, do we could become more and more simply a satellite of US policy or not? And what will govern that? And a whole range of internal debates about uh, the nature of Britain, uh, the nature of our economy, um, and attitudes of, of various parts of British public opinion. I mean, in particular, we've seen a, a very significant degree of uh, concern over the situation in Gaza from parts of our immigrant population, um, which has clearly enhanced anti-American feeling in a certain section of our population in a way that is simply not relevant if you look at um, attitudes in, in the United States where support for Israel is still significantly stronger than, um, than in Britain and indeed is significantly stronger than is support for Ukraine. So there, there are a number of factors at work here. Supposedly, um, Richard Crossman warned Clement Attlee in apocalyptic terms about the possibility of a nuclear holocaust. Um, Clement Attlee plucked on his pipe, thanked Dick Crossman for drawing his attention to it and said he'd keep an eye on it. Well, um, I think that what we've been talking about today merits several eyes being kept, kept, um, kept on it. And that's what the Federal Trust is going to do. Thank you very much indeed for the contribution. Um, we have many similar uh, podcasts and videos on our website. And I hope if you, the listener, have enjoyed this contribution, this discussion, um, you'll look at our website for more of them. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much for listening.